All right. Well, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on what part of the world you are joining us from. I am your host, Alex Faust, and very excited to have Deb Gabor uh, as our guest today. If you are not familiar with Deb and you haven't read any of her books or seen her course at Growth Institute, she's written the book on branding now three times with bestsellers uh, as such as Branding is Sex and Irrational Loyalty. She is the founder and CEO of Soul Marketing, a strategy-led marketing firm obsessed with solving major business and branding problems for clients in every industry. Her and her team at Soul Marketing have introduced her revolutionary brand strategy for organizations such as the Associated Press, Dell, Microsoft, NBC Universal, and a lot of other exciting emerging brands. She's a frequent contributor to major news outlets such as Entrepreneur, Forbes, Fortune, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. And today, I'm very excited to have her joining us to talk about her newest book, which is called Personality, uh, Person Dash Ality, Cultivate Your Human Authority to Ignite Irrational Brand Loyalty. So Deb, welcome back to Conversations at the Edge. And uh, where are you calling in from today? Well, I'm just outside of Salt Lake City, Utah right now, so I can enjoy uh, lots and lots of snow. And skiing this afternoon, I hear. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Well, to start, um, I'd love to you know just open it up and have you kind of share what is the new book, Personality, all about? All right. Well, um, a lot of people have read Branding Your Sex, which introduced the irrational loyalty methodology, which is the method that we use inside my company to build brands, which applies to not just the biggest, best, most legendary brands in the world, but also for businesses really at any stage, whether they serve consumers or they serve other businesses. And Irrational Loyalty, the book was the continuation of that. And if I had the opportunity to write these books in a different order, I'd probably would have written personality first. So personality as a book really takes this methodology and talks about the humanization of brands through the authority of the leaders of those brands. So personality is a book, it's in two parts. The first book really talks about this concept of authority, what authority is, how you create it, how you earn it, um, you know, people who act with authority in the world, how that creates brand goodness for them, what the connection between authority and brand magic and brand love is and irrational loyalty. And then the second half of the book really talks about the path to monetizing authority. So um, this book really is about this like sort of weird amorphous concept of authority, which I don't think has been written about or uh, really talked about probably in five or six years. And so it was a really good opportunity for me to really look at a moment in time where people were requiring the brands that they used, whether they were B2B or B2C brands, to show up in a very, very human way. So that's what the book is about. So what does it mean to communicate your authority in a human way versus a non-human way? Uh, I think that that's best expressed through the sharing of some experiences that I had at the beginning of the pandemic. And so um, people who read this book, you'll you'll probably see this, but I, I, I wrote a somewhat quirky and cheeky letter that was the amalgamation of all of the emails that I received to my inbox at the beginning of the pandemic from the CEOs of brands that I didn't even remember that I had patronized, right? So do you remember this, Alex? Like right when the pandemic started, we started getting those hashtag we're all in this together emails, the, you know, we're thinking about you. And at this difficult time, remember, it was unprecedented times, how many times that phrase was used. Um, and, and so this idea of communicating with authority is to not do that, not to send the same email that every other brand is sending to customers that you really have no relationship with, to share with them, you know, your somewhat inauthentic, insincere, and just the same as everyone else sentiments, right? So 
Um, communicating with authority is to really humanize your interactions and the experience that people have with the brand by truly showing what your own GUI insights are. So as the CEO or leader of an organization, regardless of the size of the organization, regardless of the type of customers you have or the type of marketing that you do, the leaders of those brands, they, they carry some authority. They are like the human walking billboard for the brand. They are the person who, who is out there sort of expressing the sentiments of the brand, who, who are being the human touch points for where the rubber meets the road from a branding perspective. So, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, not only did I receive like, you know, probably close to seven or 800 of these emails from e-commerce places where I had bought one or two items sometime in the past three years, I also received a lot of automated communication that both came into my email as well as in my social feeds. Um, things like, uh, you know, after we, after the WHO announced that we had a global pandemic uh, and, and the world basically was shutting down, I was still receiving emails, like one from Costco that was asking me to give a star rating to the legal pads I had just bought, or another email um, that I received from a clothing retailer that sent me an email with the subject line, staycation is better than vacation, that was advertising a bunch of comfy clothes and things like that. That is like, the antithesis to communicating with authentic, sincere human authority. So um, really this idea of authority is, is establishing a footprint of leadership that relies on your unique point of view, your, your well-informed you know, vis-a-vis -vis your, your customers, your well-informed kind of relationship with those customers, all designed to create that condition of irrational loyalty. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I appreciate you going into that. And just a reminder for the folks who are here, if you do have questions, type them into the chat or the Q&A. The last 10 minutes are for you. And I'll certainly get those questions over to Deb. Um, so, you know, obviously the first portion of your book is about this idea of authority and how it relates to attracting customers. So how does this building of authority actually generate, you know, new leads and new customers for your business. You talked a lot about the stuff that certainly doesn't work. What is working? So what is working in the world of authority today is when the leaders of brands use the platform of their brand, that brand awareness, the irrational loyalty, the advocacy, the mass and momentum of their brands to express a unique point of view and, and use their own point of view and the platform of their brand to attract to them customers who are aligned with those ideas and with those sentiments. Um, probably best shared through a really good example. Again, something that happened at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, one of the hardest hit it, one of the hardest hit industries, of course, was travel and tourism, right? And one of the biggest brands in that area that, you know, really does have a lot of authority is Airbnb. And um, a lot of people probably remember at the beginning of, of the uh, pandemic, Brian Chesky, who founder founder of uh, Airbnb, he sent this open letter to employees, basically, you know, letting them know everything that was happening. He was delivering kind of good news, bad news, mostly bad news in that they were doing sweeping layoffs. They were um, communicating to their community of homeowners and travelers, you know, that the whole world has changed, that this was a time where Airbnb as a brand was going to rely on all of its assets and its past experiences to really look at travel in a different way and reinvent the way people travel and the way people use Airbnb. And as a result, and everything that the company did sort of led by Chesky as the person who was the expert voice on not just renting your home temporarily to 
to travelers, but being an expert voice on how the travel industry was going to respond to sweeping environmental, demographic, geopolitical, uh, you know, widespread health changes. He was using that platform of his brand to express a unique point of view and sort of set the tone and direction for the organization. Um, as a person who who owned Airbnbs and you know was was sort of stunned by what happened and you know part of my income got cut off and and all of this I was really looking for a, a voice and some leadership in the wilderness to help me know where to be what to think what to do uh where you know wh where to stand even so in a time of crisis especially human beings are are looking for leadership and when there's a vacuum of leadership and there's a vacuum of communication people make up stories and they're never good stories right and so authority is the thing that gives the leaders of organizations the opportunity to set the course for what's going to happen and in the process earn people's irrational loyalty. And just as a review for everybody, irrational loyalty is the condition where people are so indelibly bonded to a brand that they'd feel like they were cheating on it if they were to choose an alternative. And authority is really the pinnacle of that. And it, and it comes from real human beings. And so does it work if, say, the CEO doesn't necessarily want to be front-facing, doesn't want to be like the chief of brand? Um, or they're not interested in being synonymous with the brand? Like, how do you manage that kind of relationship? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good question. A authority doesn't necessarily have to come from the CEO. Authority can come from anyone. Um, I actually consult with and, and coach a number of people who are even just mid-level managers in their organization about communication, communicating with authority. So as the CEO, you don't have to be the walking billboard for your brand. And, and I'll say, like, if you read Irrational Loyalty, there's an entire chapter in there called CEOs Gone Wild, where CEOs have taken the authority um, that was bestowed upon them by their association with the brand, and they've, like, pretty much tanked their brand. I think about brands like uh, Uber and Travis Kalanick. I think today about the interesting relationship between Elon Musk and, say, Twitter and things like that. There's a very, very strong relationship there. But CEOs don't necessarily have to be the human authority of the brand, but every brand needs to humanize itself through these deeply human connections. And so what does authority mean when we're not talking about, you know, directly that one human being who's going to be like the spokesperson for the brand? That means making sure that your communication always has a point of view. If you're writing a blog, the blog needs to have a byline and it needs to be from a human being who infuses that writing and that content with their own life experience and their own unique point of view. So, so, um, you know, it, it, as the CEO of any organization, you are responsible for the brand. You don't have to be the brand, but branding starts at the top, right? It's not owned by the marketing department. It's not owned by some position like, you know, VP of brand or the chief marketing officer. It really is owned by the leadership of the company. So, you know, as the CEO, as the leader of your company, uh, you need to understand what what is the footprint of authority that your brand has? What is your brand's point of view? What is your sincere authoritative position on what your role and relevance is to the world? Every brand needs a position and that can emanate from members of the leadership team, but it can be delivered by other people in the organization. Yeah. And I think for a lot of our listeners and community members, you know, who are using scaling up, that's why core values are so important so that, you know, the brand can be lived by many um, under the guidelines and values uh, yeah. that the company has established. And, and this whole book is about this idea of portable authority. <clears throat> portable authority is when you have you have established this authority by having a clear point of view. Um, a lot of people call it thought leadership, you know, sort of having a platform of thought leadership or an executive platform. And, and then that 
authority, you can take that with you anywhere. I know from my experience with the scaling up community um, and with you know most of the clients that I've worked with over the the, the past 30 years or so, organizations, um, the leaders of those organizations, most of them have a purpose that is uh, far greater than just you know running that organization, being a profitable and and contributing organization to society. They have goals. You know the reasons that they started their businesses and they they continue their businesses is because it has a meaning that goes far above what the functional benefits of the products and services are that they're providing. When you have a platform of portable authority, you can take that anywhere. One of the examples that I give in the book, I'm a huge fan of Salesforce as a brand. Like I've watched everything they've done kind of from the beginning. And you look at a guy like Mark Benioff, you know, who went from reinventing the way that we do software, basically creating what is the de facto standard for the software industry today, which is cloud-based software. You know, he had to use the platform as, of his authority to completely disrupt an industry and a category. But then he's taken that platform of authority into other areas where he's not involved in the day to day goings on at Salesforce now. But he uses that platform of authority to talk about how the world of work has changed, how, you know, how employees engage with companies. You know, what is the, the way that today's organizations need to do business? You can take that authority with you anywhere you go, whether it's to another company or it's to your own personal endeavors or something that you want to do for the community. And so that's the idea of establishing a platform of authority. That's great. And I, I think, you know, Reed Hoffman's another person who I feel like has done that really well from, from LinkedIn. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and there's so many really good examples there. Um, likewise, there are examples of, you know, sort of like authority misused, authority gone bad. If you read the book, I talk about people who have become accidental authorities, Joe Rogan being one of those people. You know, Joe Rogan is seen as somebody who has a, a somewhat contrarian personality um who you know is somewhat disruptive in his in his point of view but you know he always talks about the fact that he was sort of thrust into this position of authority he never set out to be an authority and and many many people the world over have associated him his point of view his choice of guests that he brings onto his podcast what he does how he engages with the media and they sort of bestowed him with an authority platform that he never wanted. So there's all different kinds of authority. There's kind of like the planned and managed and strategic authority. And then, you know, there are, there are people who become authorities by accident, sometimes unknowingly, unwittingly, and sometimes to the detriment of their relationships with their audience. Yeah. So I know the, I want to kind of get to the other side of the book, not just on the authority building, but as we kind of make that transition, um, you have this rule of reciprocity uh, that's playing a role in rehumanizing the brands and building authority. Can you talk about this idea of building out reciprocity? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea of reciprocity, I wish I owned that, but that's a basic tenet of psychology and sociology. And basically it means I do something nice for you then you do something nice for me, right? And there are three kinds of reciprocity. There's general reciprocity, which is what I just described. There's balanced reciprocity, which is when I give something to you with the expectation that when it's time for you to give to me, because I gave to you, that you'll give to me. And then there's negative reciprocity, which the internet is full of negative reciprocity today. Negative reciprocity today is using the platform of your authority, using your point of view, sharing information with people, all with the idea that they're obligated to give you something in return. So this idea of reciprocity works on the principle that people shouldn't feel obligated to give you something in return. So Alex, have you ever signed up for something on a website to get some information, say for instance, a digital download of some kind? Of course. Of course, right? And then what happens? Your email inbox is flooded with promotions. 
right? Buy this, buy this, buy this. That's an example of negative reciprocity. So one of the things that's happened over the past couple of years is we've lowered the bar for authority. Basically, when we sent everybody home during the pandemic, gave them a camera, a ring light, and a microphone, we created a world where anybody with a point of view, whether it's well-informed and authoritative or not, can style themselves as an expert, get out there on the internet, start sharing information, all with the purpose of selling you something, right? So that's an example of negative reciprocity. And, and you you know it when you see it, right? I mean, I, I, I see it all the time. I spend a lot of time on Instagram. Um, and you know, there there are there are coaches, pundits, experts, people who are out there, you know, they're sharing information with you, they're asking you to go to their website, sign up for this thing, get my free ebook on this subject or whatever, and then they are just gonna pound you with offers, right? It feels gross. It's sort of like the online equivalent of you know, receiving a dick pic on Tinder. Or, you know, a little bit like going to the used car lot. I mean, I'm not exaggerating here. It feels really gross. You know it when you see it. That activity, that use of negative reciprocity, I give you something of value and you give me something in return, which is your attention. Sometimes it's your email address. Sometimes it's your like, your follow, you know, some kind of fandom there. And then you're going to just pummel me with messages that are going to beat me into submission until the point that I, that I actually buy something from you, right? That is killing authority. That activity is killing authority. And so the basics of reciprocity are just this. If you are ready to be an authority, that means that you are ready to share information from yourself, from your point of view, from your experience, from your work, share it with other people for free without any expectation of anything in return. It's the idea of helping versus selling, right? And so that's how authority works. You know, people who are experts, who who have a platform of authority are people who give generously of themselves, who generously share their point of view and helpful information that's designed to attract people to them so that when those people are ready, they will actually lean forward and tell you what they want to buy from you rather than you just like dumping on them. This is, you know, LinkedIn is a very, very powerful platform for building authority in, in the business world, right? And what we see on LinkedIn is, you know, I send you a connection request, you accept my connection request. And then the very next thing I get in my LinkedIn inbox is an invitation for me to do a 15 minute fact finding call where you're going to sell me like a 10, 25,000, you know, 30, thousand dollar offer, right? It feels gross, doesn't it? Rather than like using LinkedIn as a channel and a platform to establish authority, put information out there, share blog posts, share long form content, share videos where you're talking about helpful things that are going to help your target audience actually manage their way through whatever are the challenges and opportunities of your industry, your category or whatever, then people are going to start engaging with you. And so... Um, authority and reciprocity, it relies on this idea of attracting and cultivating community by giving to a community rather than selling to them. Thank you for that. And just a reminder, uh, there's about eight minutes left. So if you do have questions, please, uh, send them through the chat and I'll get them over to Deb. Um, so I'm, you know, with this idea of reciprocity, how long can the reciprocity strategy go on before you actually need to make money and generate cash flow to keep the business afloat so you can continue with the goodwill sharing? Yes. So authority is monetizable. It just has to be done in the right way. So, um, you know, you can't just like give and give and give and give and give without ever being able to monetize that authority. And authority monetizes in two ways. One, authority monetizes in the way that if you establish a footprint of authority, you create awareness. People understand your point of view. They become curious about your company, what your co company offers. They can see themselves being aligned with your value 
values and beliefs as a brand and an organization, then they patronize the brand. That's one way that authority monetizes. Another way that authority monetizes is you can actually create a world where you sell information products. And there's a good story in the book about my own experience in doing that. So back in 2016, when my first book came out, I wasn't thoughtful and deliberate about how I wanted that book to serve me in business. I just was compelled to write a book. I'm a person who's compelled to share this information with people. And I was not prepared for the success of that book and the popularity of branding as sex. But then all of a sudden, um, I saw an opportunity. I was like, you know what, this methodology that I give away for the price of a book, maybe I can create an online platform where people will buy from me an online platform where they can create their brand using this methodology that I created. So I invested literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in building an online platform to do this. And then I put it out there to the world and it was just crickets. And the reason that it was just crickets was number one, I didn't have a community of people to actually sell it to people with whom I had built up enough trust that they were willing to throw down the 10 or $15,000 it was going to cost them to actually go through that process. Right. And, you know, I, I just, I hadn't cultivated a community and I hadn't given to them enough to be able to ask them for money. So there are steps in creating authority, whether you want to use that authority to monetize your brand by drawing the right kinds of, of customers, investors, you, you know, supporters of your brand to you through that, that community, or you're looking to actually sell your authority, sell information products that monetize, I always tell people it's the community, stupid. Like you you have to cultivate a community. So a side note about that experience of spending like $100,000 to, to build an online platform that nobody wanted, that is not at all what people wanted to buy from me. They didn't want to buy the methodology. They wanted to buy me. And so I, you know, I invested in this thing that like it still sits on the shelf today. And it, it's really never seen the light of day. It turns out what people wanted from me was me, not an online platform that was somewhere between that and me. So I had to sort of change the, the, the authority monetization structure. I hope that answers your question. But, you know, really, like, it's the community stupid is what I tell people all the time. And there are examples of this all over the place. So before you want to create information products that monetize for your business, or you want to use your authority to attract to you, to, to serve as a magnet to attract to you, people who are going to support your brand, make sure that you go through the hard work of cultivating community by giving to them. People ask me, they're like, what's the magic formula? There is no magic formula, but a good rule of thumb is give at least four times before you ask somebody for anything, whether that's their email address, or it's asking them for a like or a follow, or it's asking for information from them. Make sure that the ratio is balanced more towards the giving side than the asking side. Are there any areas where this strategy of like reciprocity and authority building is not relevant? Um, hmm, that's a really good question. Um, I think, it, you know, my opinion is it's relevant to every brand. I mean, obviously, like I'm like a carpenter with a hammer. And so, you know, if I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So everything looks like a branding problem to me. And I think about, you know, regardless of the size or the stage of the company, what are the things that we can do to turn this into a legendary brand within its scale and scope, right? Legendary brands have authority. Legendary brands are very, very human. The human beings associated with the brand, whether they are out there being spokespeople for the brand, or they're very, very quietly infusing the organization with their passions, their purpose, their values, and doing it in a very, very quiet way, that can mean the difference between a truly legendary brand and maybe an also ran brand. So I don't think that there are any categories where this is not relevant. People ask me, they're like, oh, I sell to other businesses. Is authority necessary? Well, most of the examples that are in the book that talk about these are people who have actually cultivated a platform of authority, they come from the B2B world. And I think it's becoming 
becoming increasingly important if you sell to other businesses because you know B2B branding is sort of evolving to a place where it's taking on a lot of the qualities of consumer branding because at the end of the day people buy things from people and and you know as a B2B entity you're not selling to like a, a building that is made up of you know steel girders and and bolts and and nails and glass right there are human beings inside that business for whom what they buy the decisions they make for their company are all part of their ascendance to this place of self actualization and and so i think it's becoming increasingly important important in the b2b world especially as b2b entities are really really stepping up their focus on content Awesome. Thank you so much for, for diving into the B2B area as well, because we did have a question about building uh, authority in the B2B space. Um, but with just about two minutes left, Deb, I just want to give you the opportunity, any final things that you think our community should know um, about your book, about branding in general, about moving into 2023 and what's going to be expected of them. I just want to kind of pass it over to you for any final thoughts. Yeah. In two minutes, the things that I would share is, first of all, the characteristics of the best brands in the world, they, they all have these four things. Number one, they aim their brand at an ideal archetypal customer. That's whether they serve consumers or they serve other businesses. For other businesses, it's that human being who is the one who's going to use the brand. And when I say use the brand, they're going to use that brand to elevate their own self-concept. Then they become part of that person's identity. They become part of who they are. They help them express who they are not just to other people, but to themselves. They're not just different. They're singular. The best brands in the world are unique. So make sure you carve out your uniqueness. And ultimately, you make that ideal customer the hero in their own story. And that's what creates that condition of irrational loyalty. The second piece that I want to share is that in 2023 and beyond, with the... Um, it, with with the taking off of lots of sort of mixed reality technologies, new technologies that that sort of automate more and more processes in in the buying process in every industry uh, during the war for talent, like everybody is looking to automate things. When you automate things using technology, you dehumanize processes. It speeds things up. It makes us more efficient. It makes us more effective. It improves profitability. It improves delivery. But content and authoritative content that has a unique point of view that expresses your values and beliefs and uses those values and beliefs as a magnet to attract people to your brand is going to become increasingly important as you automate. So that's what I would say for 2023 is make sure that as you automate, that you're also thinking about how do I also humanize the brand while I dehumanize the transactional nature of it. And that's really where authority comes in. Fantastic. Well, Deb, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you to the community for joining us live um, and can't wait to dig into the rest of your book. So hope you have a great holiday season and uh, we'll see you all in the new year. Well, thank you, Alex. Happy New Year to everybody. Take care. Thanks all. Bye-bye.